Greetings and welcome back to the Harvard Classics volume number four and more particularly now lecture 32 where we will be treating Paradise Regained book four, the last book of this amazing epic. Uh, I recommend that if you haven't done it, that you go to my site, learnstrong.net, you go down that left hand side, find the Harvard Classics, go to, uh, my first of all, my lectures on Paradise Lost. I, dare, I, I recommend that you've watched those and for sure I recommend that you've watched my Paradise Regain lectures. I'm going to work now quickly through my intro comments here, simply assuming that you've been with me. Of course, we define learning as that capacity to connect new information to old information. We'll do a lot of that here in this lecture and then in my final lecture, which kind of assumes all of my thinking about Paradise, both Lost and Regain, more particularly Regain. Well, um, our three levels of reading, what's the text say, what does the text mean, how do we relate to the text? and our three perspectives of Paradise Regained as epic, Paradise Regained as philosophic theological text, and Paradise Regained as political text, both at the, both at the psychological and the sociological level. Well, have lots to say about all of those things as we now move through book four. A brief summary uh, of books one, two, and three of Paradise Regained. Um, uh, book one, the temptation, of course, turn rocks into bread. Man shall not live by bread alone. Uh, book two, eat this amazing devil's meal, then the temptations as they unfold. Book three, um, become a real king and know how to go to war and win that war. We now turn to the last book and the last of the biblical temptations. We have to say this because... Milton plays the game of seeing the life of Christ and, and Christ's ministry as a series of tests, temptations, struggles. But we also are going to recognize that maybe Milton himself, and I would put this in my notes, is going through a process of dealing with some of his own challenges and temptations. Let's turn now to the opening lines of Book 4. Again, no argument provided. Let's read the first 23 lines just to get a sense of where we are. Perplexed and troubled at his bad success, the tempter, devil, stood, nor had what to reply, discovered in his fraud, thrown from his hope so oft, and the persuasive rhetoric, we think of Plato, Socrates, that sleeked, we think of that word slack and how important that is in Paradise Lost, his tongue, and won so much on Eve, so little here, nay, lost, and again we're to this whole notion of Paradise Lost, of course, what can be lost is going to allow for Paradise Regained, but Eve was Eve, this far his, the Satan, Satan devil, overmatch, who, self-deceived and rash, beforehand had no better weight the strength he was to cope with or his own. But, as a man who had been matchless held, this is an interesting simile, in cunning overreached where least he thought to salve his credit and for very spite still will be tempting him who foils him still and never cease though to his shame the more. Or, as a swarm of flies in vintage time above the wine press where sweet must is poured, Beat off returns as oft with humming sound. We think of Lord of the Flies here immediately, don't we? Or surging waves against the solid rock, the wall to shivers dash. Notice the three or the three similes here, one right after the other. The assault renewed, vain battery. Here we think of of that passage from Iliad 15, uh, 618 to 621, the, the, the waves of troops hitting. Uh, so Satan, whom repulse upon repulse met ever into shameful silence brought, yet gives not or, though desperate of success. We could say this about Satan, Milton Satan, at least he keeps trying one time after another, and of course the outcome is inevitably going to be, just like in Paradise Lost, what it is. It's not that we read these poems to try and figure out what's going to happen, but rather we enjoy watching how Milton will prescribe what we know is going to happen in the way that he does it. Uh, uh, line 26, he takes Jesus to a high mountain, maybe Nefetis top again, just like from Paradise Lost. Mountains, of course, are always important for Milton. And at line 33, he shows Christ Rome, the majesty of Rome, of course. Um, well, uh, note the ironies involved here. Of course, Milton, as Protestant, is going to take a stab at, uh, at Catholics, and more particularly at Catholic Rome. He points out at line... Um, um, at line 56, the houses of God, uh, of, of the gods. Uh, it, it's interesting that, that what Milton is saying here is that Rome became this great and amazing rich city, and of course Christian Rome, for Catholic Christian Rome, became also a, a, a lavish city. Um, at line 61, we have Milton's epic catalogs happening again, 
showing his prodigious and his classical learning, which I think is going to be important because ironically, later in this very book, we're going to have Jesus Christ talking about the problems with classical learning and the limits of classical philosophy. Um, Satan's temptation here is, why don't you expel, at line 100 or so, why don't you expel the nasty Romans, like get rid of them, expel this monster from his throne, this disgusting um, you know, Caligulus and all of these nasty emperors, get rid of all of them. And then starting at line 100, he says it, mightest thou expel this monster from his throne, now make a sty, and in his place ascending, a victor people, free from servile yoke. In other words, one more time, just like in the last book, let's lead, let's lead the people. And he says, ironically, and there's a lot of humor here, with my help thou mayest to me, the power is given, and by that right I give to thee. Aim, therefore, at no less than all the world. Aim at the highest, without the highest attained will be for thee no sitting, or for long on David's throne, be prophesied what will. It's interesting that Satan will say, aim for the highest, and of course, taken... In its positive instantiation, that's a good idea, and of course in its negative, not such a good idea. The idea that power is given will come back to here in a few moments. Of course, the Luke 4 passage 5 through 7 will uh, suggest as much as well. Christ's reply at 109 to 113 is fascinating. Let's just read it. He says it, to whom the Son of God unmoved replied, nor doth this grandeur and majestic show of luxury, though called magnificence more than of arms before, allure mine eye much less my mind. Now I'm going to have more to say about this in my final thoughts on Paradise Regained, but I'll say it now. It seems to me that Paradise Regained, Milton is suggesting that we have three major kinds of temptations for Christ, the Son of God. One is, of course, a one about the body, temptation one, feed the body survival. The second, we use the word just now, mind. I believe that the second one we're going to demonstrate is a challenge or a temptation of the mind. And then finally, the third temptation will be the temptation of spirit. We'll, we'll have more to say about this in, in, in ensuing uh, lectures. Um, the, the idea at line 123 um, that, that is, is this idea of Christ, the Son of God, will say about Roman honor. He calls it a tedious waste of time, these outlandish flatteries. And then at line 127 to 142, he's going to make an observation or two about Rome. I shall, thou sayest, expel um, a brutish monster. What if I withal expel a devil who first made him such? Let his tormentor conscience find him out. For him, I was not sent nor yet to free that people. In other words, I'm not going to free the, the, the people who, the, who are subservient to the Romans. Victor, once now vile and base, deservedly made vassal, who once just frugal and mild and temperate conquered well, but govern ill the nations under yoke, peeling their provinces, exhausted all by lust and rapine, first ambitious groan of triumph, that insulting vanity, then cruel by their sports to blood inured, of fighting beasts and men to beast exposed, luxurious by their wealth and greedier still, and from the daily scene, Effeminate. Now, this is interesting because this takes us back in many ways to Paradise Lost, Book 11, uh, line 635. Even we're going to get to Samson Agonistes in, in lectures to come, uh, lines 410 and 562. Uh, this idea that as men become, and, uh, and especially from Milton men, as men become increasingly exposed to luxuries, they become effeminate and weak, and he will, Christ will say, the Son of God will say, this is what happened, this is what happened to Rome. Uh, and, and then at line, um, and then to continue uh, down through line 153, he says it, um, what wise and valiant man would seek to free these thus degenerate by themselves enslaved, or could of inward slaves make outward free? Know therefore, when my season comes to sit on David's throne, it shall be like a tree. This is, of course, one of the great Miltonic examples of, uh, of symbolism spreading and overshadowing all the earth. We think of the Daniel 4, 10 through 11 passage, right? Um, or as a stone, we think of the stones that should be, maybe could be uh, created for bread, shall, uh, that shall to pieces dash all monarchies besides throughout the world. And of my kingdom there shall be no end. Means there shall be to this. But what the means is, not for thee to know, nor me to tell. In other words, leave me alone in regards to this project. 
um, my kingdom is my own business, if you will. Satan's response at 154 um, and following to 169 is fascinating. And in it, of course, we have this famous from the Bible, uh, worship me. The tempter and prudent replied, impudent replied, I see all offers made by me now slight thou valuest because of offered and rejects. Nothing will please the difficult and nice. I love the irony and the humor in all of this. Or nothing more than still to contradict. On the other side, know also thou that I, on what I offer, set as high esteem, nor what I part with mean to give for aught. All these which in a moment thou beholdest, the kingdoms of the world, to thee I give, for given to me I give to whom I please. Again, echoing that Luke 4, 5 through 7 line. No trifle. Yet with this reserve, not else, on this condition, if thou wilt fall down and worship me as thy superior Lord, easily done, it's in parenthetics for Milton, and hold them all of me, for what can less so great a gift deserve? Satan wants to be worshipped. Of course, he was thrown out of heaven because he refused to be worshipped back to paradise lost. And of course, once he gets to hell, he does everything in his power to make the demons there worship him. Now he's saying, it's not that hard. Why don't you just worship me? And that'll be great. The response at line 170 is worth our time to read. Christ's response, the Savior answered with disdain, I never liked thy talk. Thy offers less. Now, both abhor, since thou hast dared, it's fun that that word gets used, to utter the abominable terms, impious condition, but I endure the time, till which expired thou hast permission on me. It's written, and then he quotes uh, from Deuteronomy 6.13 and 10.20, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him shalt serve, and darest thou to the Son of God propound to worship thee accursed? Now, more accursed, we think, of course, of, of, the, uh, of the idea of, uh, uh, of paradise lost and the use of the word accursive for this attempt bolder than that on Eve. It's fascinating that Milton has Christ say something about Eve and the story of Genesis 3 because of course Jesus himself never in the Gospels mentions at all the quote unquote fall of man and woman in the garden, right? And more blasphemous. In other words, trying to, trying to get Eve to fall is not as bad as trying to get the Son of God to fall. Which expect to rue the kingdoms of the world to thee were given, permitted rather, and by thee usurped over donation none but canst produce it given by him, by whom, but by the king of kings, God, over all supreme. In other words, God gave you the power that you're, that you're saying that you can give to me. If then to thee be thee how fairly is the giver, and giver is capitalized for those of you who are Lois Lowry, Lowry fans, now repay, but gratitude in thee is lost long since. We have all of these different losses that will come back in Paradise Regained. Again, these reversals. Wert thou so void of fear or shame as offer them to me, the Son of God, to me my own on such abhorred pact, that I fall down and worship thee as God? Get thee behind me. And of course, this Luke 4, 8, Matthew 16, 23, um, we've talked about it already, this get thee behind me, Satan, forever damned. Well, that's an interesting response, and, and uh, Satan's um, counter to all of this is to come back and say, well, at line 195, the humor, <laughs> to whom the fiend, with fear abashed, replied, be not so sore offended, son of God, though sons of God both angels and are and been. And now Satan is great with language. Again, this is a text about interpretation, hermeneutics, if you will, right? Um, he says it. Um, I don't, don't be too upset. Don't be too upset. Um, but, but what about this thing, son of God? I mean, how are you going to define son of God? I mean, technically, aren't we all kind of sons of God? Blah, blah, blah. Um, it will be interesting how he will, how he'll play, continue to play this game. He'll say it at line 210. He says, I shall no more advise thee. Okay, okay, okay. He says, I get it. Gain them as thou canst or not. In other words, you figure out how you're going to, how you're going to become a king in your kingdom and all of that. And thou thyself seems otherwise inclined than to a worldly crown, addicted more to contemplation and profound dispute as by that early action may be judged, when slipping from thy mother's eye thou wentst alone into the temple, and of course this is the Luke 2, 41 through 50, thing about Christ as a child going and asking all of these questions, right? Among the gravest rabbis, disputing on points and questions fitting, Moses' chair teaching not taught. 
the childhood shows the man. This will remind us, of course, of uh, Wordsworth's um, uh, the child is father of the man, right? And I could wish my days to be about each, each by natural piety. The childhood shows the man as morning shows the day. Be famous then by wisdom as thy empire must extend, so let extend thy mind for all the world in knowledge. All things in it comprehend. All knowledge is not couched in Moses' law. And then he, he, he kind of continues with this. I'll no more advise thee is, of course, fun stuff, given the irony, right? Okay. Um, and then at line 236, he says it. Look once more. And he points at Athens. And he makes reference to Plato and Aristotle. Um, and we should point out that, of course, Plato and Aristotle have been with us this entire time with Milton. And, of course, it makes sense because Milton is steeped in classical learning, as we've said in many, many earlier lectures and in lectures to follow those, right? At line 259, he mentions Homer. Homer has been here the whole time, of course, the blind Homer, and, of course, blind Milton as well, for that matter, right? At 262, he mentions uh, the iambic, Satan mentions the iambic pentameter, and of course that's also ironic given the fact that Milton is writing his poems in iambic. Milton's is having hay fun here. This is why I recommend this poem to you. I think it is really one of Milton's fine, fine offerings. I mean, the irony, and I think the fact that he is challenging himself, we'll get to it in a moment, but the way in which he's challenging himself, Milton is writing in the words of Satan, challenges that are actually, I believe, kind of challenges to Milton himself, and of course, readers of all kinds. At 281 and 284, we have more fun. He says, these here revolve, or as thou likest at home till time mature thee to a kingdom's weight, these rules will render thee a king complete within thyself, much more with empire joined. To at line 285, the savior sagely replies, think not uh, at, at, uh, at at, 280, at 285, now and following to 294, um, Christ's response and his critique of philosophy. Um, I'm reading now from 285 to 294. Think not but what I know these things, or think I know them not, not therefore am I short of knowing what I ought. In other words, Christ says, I know what I need to know. We're back to this whole thing of epistemology and knowledge, right? He who receives light from above, from the fountain of light, no other doctrine needs, Though granted true, but these are false, or little else but dreams. The idea, of course, here comes back to the idea that Shakespeare's tempest is forever in Milton's mind, especially at the end of his life. And he says it. Christ says it. All of the philosophy is kind of like dreaming. Let's keep reading. Conjectures, fantasies, built on nothing firm. Again, we're thinking, of course, of those final lines of the tempest already. The first and wisest of them all possessed to know this only, that he nothing knew. Uh, of course, we think of Apology, a lecture that we gave earlier from Harvard Classics, where at line 23 AD, um, Socrates says, the only thing that I know is that I don't know anything. At line 309 to um, 330, we have Christ's critique of philosophy and what is missing for philosophy. Alas, it begins. What can they teach, the great philosophers? And not mislead, ignorant of themselves, of God much more, and how the world began, and how man fell, degraded by himself, on grace depending. In other words, there's things that Plato couldn't talk about, like, for example, how the world began, and how man fell, degraded by himself, on grace depending. Much of the soul they talk, but all awry, and in themselves seek virtue, and to themselves all glory aggregate, to God give none. In other words, the philosophers of the Greeks and the Romans will only lead you back to yourself will not lead you to God. By the way, this is one of the one of the real tensions in Christian theology from the very beginning of Christian theology because so many of the early church fathers were, of course, we think of St. Augustine, they were Platonists or Neoplatonists. They were philosophers of the ancient traditions, right? Stoic philosophies, the Gnostic tradition steeped in it. Plotinus comes to mind. And so Milton is clearly struggling with himself. Think of all of those years of his training and the obvious question is, was it all worth it? All of my studies, especially in classical training, right? Rather accuse him under usual names, fortune and fate, as one regardless quite of mortal things, who, therefore, seeks in these true wisdom, finds her not, or by delusion far worse, her false resemblance only meets an empty cloud. Philosophy is an empty cloud. Is Milton here reg regretting, maybe, some of his own study? Especially reminding us that he, he, all that study possibly led to his blindness, right? 
um, uh, to, and, and now to finish. However, many books wise men have said are wearisome. We think of the Ecclesiastes 12.12 12 passage, or we think about, um, uh, it, what is it, in uh, Meditations book 5, I think it is, that Marcus Aurelius says that he was going to put aside all, all of the books and stop reading so much. He who reads incessantly into his reading brings not a spirit and judgment equal or superior in what he brings, what needs he elsewhere seek, uncertain and unsettled, still remains deep versed in books and shallow in himself, crude or intoxicant, collecting toys and trifles for choice matters, worth a sponge. Think about that Hamlet 4 line uh, in regards to a sponge for Rosen County Illustrator. As children, gathering pebbles on the shore. Or we think, for example, of Thomas Aquinas when he was asked why he didn't finish Summa Theologica, he said in a dream that he saw himself simply taking water in a spoon from the ocean and dropping it on the, on the uh, beach and then realized, of course, the futility of human wisdom and the attempt to try to explain God through theology. Well, this is Milton, I think, struggling with Milton. Um, uh, at line 342, Christ will point out that the gods are ridiculous, maybe we would say it this way, to, and, and, I, and I like to always say this when we talk about comparative religious studies, it's often the case that our first instincts are to ridicule or make fun of other people's mythologies because, of course, our beliefs are not myths. Our beliefs are absolute certainties, and everybody else's is, of course, silliness, right? Um, and, and then finally at 361, I don't have time to read this, but it's fascinating, Christ's take on the declension of state and the ways in which a state will finally fall. Um, it reminds us, of course, of Plato's Republic 8-9. At line 365, we're told that Satan is at a loss, and since, he says it, since neither wealth nor honor, arms nor arts, kingdom nor empire places thee nor aught by me proposed in life contemplative or active, tended on by glory or fame, what dost thou in this